and uh, uh, talking about God's holiness. And today we're looking at empowered by the Spirit to be holy. But before I start, I want to ask Brother, Brother uh, Chris if he'll stand and offer a blessing over our lesson today. Brother Chris, pray, please. Father, thank you. God, thank you. Everybody say in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Empowered by the Spirit to be holy. Wow. So when we think of the word empowerment, we think of being able to do something. And, and it, we know that it's God's Spirit that gives us the power we need to be holy. You see, that word holy means to be set apart to the service of God. How many are thankful that you've been set apart? Hallelujah, I'm so thankful. Hallelujah that I've been set apart, amen, for, for the service of the Lord. Holy also means to be spiritually pure or godly. And in our, our lesson today, we're, we're looking at Acts chapter 15. And here in this chapter, the Jerusalem Council had met to discuss the topic of holiness and how it was relating to the Gentiles. So they, they reached an important conclusion that day, and we're going to be talking about it, but their conclusion was this, that the Holy Spirit within each person not only saves us, but that Holy Spirit of God purifies us. I'm so thankful. It's not our righteousness. You know what our righteousness is like, don't you? That's right. Our righteousness is like filthy wet, but it's his righteousness today. So we're beginning in Acts chapter 15, verse 1. Somehow or another, I just seem to like to want to start. Our lesson doesn't begin there, but, but I, like to, I like to start at the beginning, talking about being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. The Bible said, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Well, that was false doctrine, folks. Uh, and when therefore, verse 2, Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension. That means they disagreed with them uh, and, uh, and, and disputation with them. They determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. You see, Jerusalem was the center there where all of this began. Uh, that's where the Holy Ghost was poured out on the day of Pentecost. And so they're leaving Antioch. They're going, Paul and Barnabas, to uh, Jerusalem, and there they're going to have a conversation with the apostles and the elders about this question. Verse 3 said, And being brought on the way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them but there arose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses and the apostles and elders came together for to consider for to consider of this matter. So, so we're seeing here how that they're coming together and they're discussing uh, the topic of whether the Gentiles had to be circumcised after the manner of Moses. Well, you see, Jesus Christ, he came and fulfilled the law. And so uh, as they're conversing about this, they came to the conclusion that Paul and Barnabas and, 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 and others should go to Jerusalem and talk to the apostles and elders and get their take on this. But in reality, folks, this matter had already uh, been rehearsed a few years ago, earlier because if you remember, the Lord sent the apostle Peter down to uh, Cornelius' house, and Cornelius was a Gentile. And uh, so just by rehearsing, we... we Peter is declaring this very fact to them in, in 15 and 7 of Acts. He said, Peter said, and when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up 
Uh, they had debated this situation. They, they had even argued about this. Uh, and, but Peter, you know, something about the Apostle Peter. He had the keys to the kingdom, did he not? And so he's, he's still using that authority. He rose up and said unto them, men and brethren, ye know. Now, he's not, he's not telling them about something they don't already know. But he said, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, everybody say in God. And God which knoweth the hearts. That's the key, folks. God knows the heart. I don't know your heart. I can observe your actions, but I don't know your heart. You don't know my heart. You can observe my actions, but you don't know what's down in there. But there's one that knows. He knows the hearts. And, and, he's, and, and, and Peter, he continues on and bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. Now, pa Peter is just trying to, trying to let them know this really should not even come up as a question because God has already shown how that he makes no difference between the Jew and the Gentile because he poured out the Holy Ghost on them just like he did us. And, and so he's refreshing their memory about this. And, and it, this is what he says in verse 9, and put no difference between us and them. How? By purifying their hearts by faith. In other words, when they when they heard Peter preach the gospel, as they as he spake the word, the Bible said the Holy Ghost fell on all of those there at Cornelius's house. They received the same thing that the apostles received on the day of Pentecost, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. How did they know they got it? Because they spoke, they heard them speak in other tongues. As the Spirit gave the utterance. That's how you know you, when you get the Holy Ghost, the, the tongues are going to come with it. You don't seek the tongues. They come when you get the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Now, therefore, why, Peter's still talking to this, this council, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? In other words, under the law, you know, they just could not live that life under the law uh, because re in reality, uh, what, what was under the law only as the high priest would go in and, and they would offer that blood, that sacrifice, it did not remit or forgive their sins. Their sins were just pushed forward till the next year until the precious blood of the lamb shed his blood. Then was man able to be free from their sin. And so he's just rehearsing what the Lord has already done for his people. And he's telling them, why are you tempting God to put a yoke upon the neck of these disciples that have already been set free by the blood of the Lamb and filled with the Holy Ghost, in other words? Why would you want to put that burden back on them? Folks, whom the Son has set free is what? Free indeed. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And so, uh, so Peter, is, is, he's, he's giving them a good message here. And he's telling them that that, that that yoke that you're trying to put on them, our fathers couldn't live under that yoke and neither can we. And so he said, but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Folks, it's not by works of righteousness. It's not anything that we have done, but it's through the precious blood of Jesus Christ, that by, by the grace of God, that you and I are saved today. Amen. Nothing but the blood. Amen. Nothing but the blood. And, and if you'll notice in verse 7, uh, Peter said, God made choice among us that the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. There's something about hearing the word and believing brings what we're supposed to receive from God, and that is the infilling of his spirit. It was God, not the apostle Peter, who initiated the mission to Cornelius' household. Amen. It was God that sent Peter down to Cornelius' house. It was a God thing. God was orchestrating that, and God God is, is who is orchestrating and, and, and blessing people today. So Peter said, and God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness. Witness of what? Of their faith. Their faith was so much that when they heard the word of God, immediately the Holy Ghost fell on them. I'm going to tell you, faith is so important in this day and hour because faith is what releases God's power moving in our life today. 
And that's why the enemy is so trying to hinder our walk with God, hinder our faith with God. And, and so uh, he bare them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. So Peter's just confirming they have already received what they need for salvation. There's no need for circumcision, in other words. That's what Peter is telling them. So the Spirit's outpouring meant that God had purified or sanctified their hearts by faith. Folks, I'm going to tell you, Again, whom the sun set free is free indeed. Now, I was going to bring a little illustration, and I did not bring it. I was going to bring me a kerosene, la kerosene lantern, one empty and one full. The empty one, you would know, could not produce any light, right? Because there was no power there to fuel that light. But I was going to light me a fully filled kerosene lantern and I was going to light it and let you all know that what was inside was what was fueling the power of that flame folks when the Holy Ghost comes on the inside of us that's what fuels the flame amen amen of the power of God in our lives I hope you can get a visual of my visual today. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I come out usually with a handful of this and a handful of that and I'm thinking did I forget anything so uh, I bought was in for it, yes. And, and so uh, the spirit outpour meant that God had purified or sanctified their hearts. And folks, that's, that's God's approval. When God's spirit comes down and he fills you with the Holy Ghost, then that's him purifying and sanctifying our hearts. So, so uh, Peter's telling them God didn't put any difference between us and them. He purified their hearts by faith. Folks, the only way we're going to be purified is by our faith. Uh, hallelujah. you got to have faith. Uh, I'm going to use this scripture in a little bit, but I'm going to go ahead and quote it now. He Hebrews 11 and 6 says, but without faith, it is impossible. Everybody say impossible. In other words, it can't happen without faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Folks, you got to have faith. You say, well, I don't have very much faith. You don't have to have a whole lot. You just got to have faith as a grain of mustard seed. I'm just going to tell you, God works in a miraculous way. All you got to do is show up with some faith, and God will do the rest. So Peter's telling these leaders that day at that council about this concern, which was a non-issue. It was a non-issue since these believers had already received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Why did they need circumcision? God had already poured out his spirit upon him. God's approval was upon them. They had that faith, and they had received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So we know that they had received the spirit, which is the source or the guarantee of their sanctification. I remember, some of y'all don't date back that far, but I got a few of friends in here that can remember. Folks used to stand up and say, I thank God I'm, I'm saved and sanctified. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. I thank God that I'm saved and I've been sanctified. Hallelujah. I've been born again of the water and of the spirit. Amen. I believe there's something to this sanctification. We need to understand what has really happened in our life. And that's what this lesson's all about today. Although Peter's testimony was critical, there was somebody else that came up and began to speak. His name was the Apostle James. He held a, a crucial position there at the council that day. Some even in comment, commentary state that may, likely he may have been the pastor of the church at Jerusalem. I don't know. We can only go by what we read about things like that. That does not say that in the scripture, so let me clarify that. But James wholeheartedly endorse Peter's perspective. Folks, I'm going to tell you, when the Spirit of the Lord comes upon you, amen, there's something that's going to happen inside of you. Amen. That devil may tell you, you didn't get it, but you know what God did for you. You know what happened, amen, when you raised your hands and began to exalt the mighty name of Jesus, amen, and the Holy Ghost came down on you, amen. Somebody said, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. I can tell you about it, but I can't, you can't understand what I'm telling because you hadn't taste it if you hadn't got the Holy Ghost you don't know what I'm saying but once you taste it of the Lord you can you can witness to what I'm telling you that the Lord is good amen that the Holy Ghost is real amen that he's that God is still giving away the Holy Ghost today just like he did at the early church amen Jesus Christ the same yesterday today and forever and I just want to encourage you I want to admonish you I want to give you some kind of a word of of, of exhortation if you don't have the Holy Ghost don't leave here today without it. It's for you. 
Amen. Peter said it's for you, for your children, and for your children's children, and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall. Thank you. So after, after uh, verse 13 of Acts 15, and after they had held their peace, James answered saying, Men and brethren, hearken or listen unto me. Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. Where would you find this that he's fixing to quote? I'm not going to read it out of Amos, but he's quoting from the, from the words of the prophets out of Amos 9, 11, and 12. And here's what he said in verse 16 of Acts 15. After this, he's quoting the prophet. After this, I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the who? And all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things, known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. What James is telling that council that day, that even God himself prophesied that the Gentiles would be saved. So they're just confirming and they're witnessing what God, what God did for the Gentiles there, to those that, that Paul and Barnabas had been uh, preaching to and been seeing people filled with the Holy Ghost. And and he's just witnessing that the prophets even told us of old that this would happen, that the Gentiles would be saved. So, so James is talking to the council and telling them that the prophets agreed to the fact that God would have a people out of the Gentiles. Aren't you thankful that God's got a people out of the Gentiles today? Folks, that's you and me. We are Gentiles. Amen. Thank God. Hallelujah. And so there, but, but there's no mention of circumcision as a requirement of entrance into God's kingdom. You know what the Lord told Nicodemus, don't you? Except you're born again of the water and the spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. That's the requirements for being saved, being born again of the water and of the spirit. And so, uh, so he, he's, 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 James is uh, telling them that, you know, this is what the prophet spoke of. And, and he even argued that the spirit was already active in their lives. So James, he did give one final point in verse 19 and 20 when he said these words. He said, he said these words, wherefore my sentence is, or, or this is what I'm telling you, that we trouble them not. In other words, don't trouble them about this circumcision. That's not even for them. Uh, he said, which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write. Here's what, his, here's what his was advised to give the Gentiles. He said, but that we write unto them that they abstain. That means restrain uh, from doing or enjoying something of, of, of this ma magnitude. To abstain from pollutions of idols because... They had been idol worshippers, so they were to restrain from that and from fornication. That is nothing other than sexual immorality and from things strangled. Now, according to the, the word of God, uh, they were not to an animal that was sacrificed. Uh, they did not strangle them, and that was contrary to what, what God's plan was. They had to, uh, the throat of the animal that was sacrificed had to be cut and the blood run out of the animal, emptied out of the animal. animal, And so he was just telling them, this, this is what I'm telling them to do because they came out from among this kind of, of lifestyle. And so that doesn't, even, that doesn't even resonate with us as far as idols and, and things strangle. But, but there's plenty of immorality going on in our world today. But anyway, that's just, this is the command that he gave them. And it, even I've always thought that the command about about partaking of blood was under the law, but actually in Genesis 9, 3, and 4, the God himself gave a command about the blood, that the life was in the blood, and that's why they were not to partake of the blood. So this is, this is James's take on this from the authority of God's word, that the, this is what the Gentiles should be told to, what to do and what not to do. So, so here's the thing we've got to do. We've got to acknowledge that the Lord sanctifies us. It is the Lord that sanctifies us. Nothing that we could ever do will make us holy enough for God. Amen. But here we're looking at today how the Pharisees in that Jerusalem church, how they wrongly 
understood the means of the believer's sanctification. They were still operating within that old law-based example. So this led to a, uh, a, a work-based view of salvation that said, I'm saved because I have uh, made myself holy rather than acknowledging I have been made holy because I have been saved. We don't make ourselves holy by doing things. We are made holy because we have been saved. That's what makes us holy. And so uh, we are to walk in newness of life because we have been empowered to live a transformed life. Now, I am intrigued. Uh, th these children, little bitty kids can do this, but this old great-grandma can't do this. They can take an object that looks like some kind of robot and they can transform it into a car. It's called a transformer, exactly. But we have been transformed. Mm. Woo. Thanks to Calvary, I don't go there anymore. Thanks to Calvary, I'm not the one I used to be. Thanks to Calvary, I don't talk like I used to talk. Thanks to, thanks to Calvary, I don't even think like I used to think. Thanks to Calvary, I don't even walk like I used to walk. Thanks to Calvary, I don't even, I don't even meditate on those, those, those thoughts anymore because I have been transformed. Hallelujah. I have been born again, a brand new creature in Christ Jesus. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. We are a brand new creature in Jesus Christ today. And I want to tell you, God does a good work. I said he does a good work. He doesn't do a halfway job. He does it right amen so the apostle paul he carefully he parallels the believer's experience of salvation with the saving work of christ in the gospel message of his death and burial and resurrection paul said in 15 and 3 he said for i delivered i'm sorry first corinthians 15 and 3 for i delivered unto you first of all that which i also received how that christ died for our sins according to the scripture. It's his blood that saved us from our sins. Not our righteousness. Not our good works. Do you understand where I'm going with this? It's his, his goodness. It's his love. It's his blood. And that he, he, talking about Jesus, was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Folks, it's so important that we understand that that what resurrection means you see uh resurrection and being revived are not the same thing if you revive somebody you bring them back to life okay you revive them but the sad part is that one day they'll die literally again but to be resurrected is to be given new life on the other side of death on the, and that's what Jesus was. He was resurrected. Amen. He went through. He was, he, he was crucified. He died. He was buried. But he resurrected. He rose again on that other side of death. Hallelujah. So somebody who merely revives, uh, they, they, they will have to experience death again. But one who has experienced resurrection never has to face death again. Now look at here, folks. The resurrected life is given gifted to all believers in Jesus Christ who have received the gift of his Holy Spirit. You see, this resurrected life, everybody say resurrected life. This resurrected life bears no con con uh, connection to the previous life. Amen. Why? It is an entirely new life kind of life we were resurrected out of that watery grave amen to newness of life amen that old man died out amen I said that old man died out in that watery grave our sins were washed away in that watery grave never everybody say never to be remembered against us again. I'm going to tell you that's what happened when you got in that water. Your sins were never to be remembered again against you. It is life at, of an entirely different order. And Paul said to the church at Rome in 6, 6, and 7, he said, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. 
Now, y'all getting quiet on me. Y'all know where I'm going with this. I'm, I'm taking this from the book. I'm not, I'm not talking about what I think. I'm, this is coming from the book. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. When you went down in that watery grave, that body of sin was destroyed. And the only way it wasn't is if you went down, a, a, if you went in that water and you hadn't repented of your sin, all you did was got wet. You went down, you went down a dry sinner and came up a wet sinner. But if you, <laughs> well, I'm telling the truth. I'm telling the truth. Amen. And so uh, that, that the body of sin might be destroyed. In other words, we died out to sin that moment when we were water baptized in Jesus' name. And, and that uh, henceforth, we should not serve sin. Folks, when you've been born again, the want to to sin ain't there no more. Well, some don't believe me here. I can tell. I didn't get 100% on that. But I didn't say that. The book said that. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he, I noticed that word too, Brother Russian. For he that is dead is freed from sin. When you are dead, a dead man ain't going to do nothing. That is poor English. A dead man is not going to do anything. I'll get those double negatives out of there, you teachers in here. I know a little bit of grammar. But we were set free. We died out. Sin no longer had any rule over us. Why? Because we're dead. The want to's gone. We've died out to that sin. We don't want to do those things anymore. Why? This body of sin has been destroyed in the water, in, ba- in the water, in the baptisms. You see, henceforth we should not serve sin because we have been freed from its power. Sin no longer has a hold on us. Yes, y'all, some of y'all are wondering this question, so I'm going to answer it right now. Yes, Christians may still sin. But. We no longer live under sin's dominion. You, you can walk through that blood and, 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 and do things that are wrong. But I'm going to tell you, you better repent. You better repent. You better get under the blood. You better get it under the blood. Amen. Amen. And so, so yes, Christians do sin, but that is not the will of God. The will of God is that you follow God and live for him and do what the Spirit is, being led of the Spirit. Romans 6 and 14 says, for sin, here's the confirmation, for sin shall not, everybody say shall not. For sin shall not have dominion. What does dominion mean? It means authority. It means control. It means power. It means sway. So sin shall not have control over you or dominion over you. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. Folks, the grace of God hath hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness. Folks, you got to deny some things. I said, you got to deny some things. You got to say, uh-uh, that ain't for me. That ain't for me. No, no, I've been born again. That denying uh, ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live how? Soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. That's what the grace of God teaches us. That's what grace does for us. And so we have been given power through the sanctifying spirit to resist and defeat sinful strongholds in our life. Do you know what causes people to sin? It's because they get too close to what the devil's offering them. That is the truth. But, but we've, got, we've been given power through the sanctifying spirit to resist that, that temptation, to resist what the enemy is putting out there. We have got the power. Folks, if you don't use the power, it's just like anything. You don't use it, you... Exactly. 
The writer said, submit you therefore to God. What? Resist the devil. You've got the power to resist. It's up to you and me whether we do resist. We can say, go ahead. I'm going to go on and do what I want to do. Never mind. I'm just going to. No. We can say, "Uh -uh. uh-uh. Uh-uh. That's not for me. That's that old, what that old man used to do. That's what that old woman used to do. But not anymore. I've been set free. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sin doesn't have any dominion or authority in my life. That is so beautiful. What a, what, what a wonderful world it would be if everybody was saved by grace. You wouldn't have to lock your doors. You could leave your keys in your car. I'm talking about Grace. I'm just talking about grace. There used to be a time in America, because I remember my husband telling me about one boy down in Cotton Lake Bottom. It wasn't him. But down back in those days, they didn't have air conditioning. They might have a fan in the window. You know how you, know how you put a big old fan in the window, and you blow it out to bring cool air back in, circulate that air. And one of the boys thought how funny it would be to run through these folks' house from one end. It was called a shotgun house. It means the, the, the rooms are straight in a line from the living room, bedroom, kitchen, straight through. You go one door and just keep going. He got him some uh, firecrackers. He went running through there and with those swinging those firecrackers and, and, and waking up the whole house. And they're thinking that they had, they'd being besieged by guns. Of course, nowadays... You know, you wouldn't know it was a, a mean teenager acting crazy. Nowadays, you'd think somebody really was shooting. But I'm just saying, back in those days, they could leave the doors unlocked. Nobody would, you know, nobody would bother them, except them hoodlums up Cotton Lake Bottom. <laughs> I said that because he uses that phrase. Uh, but I'm just saying, what a wonderful world it would be. Folks, we need to do, we, we need to do more in getting sal- folks saved. They got all kinds of ideas, reformation, helping them not be poor anymore. Folks, if, if, unless their hearts change, they, go, they, got, they can have a pocket full of money, and they're still going to do what, they wanted, what the devil tells them to do. And the, the thief cometh not but to steal, kill, and destroy. It don't matter if they got plenty of money. They're still going to steal because it's inside here. Uh-huh. Reformation and, and all this stuff, ain't gonna, it's going to take the blood of Jesus the grace of God to save folks. And that's what we need to be telling in this, in this day and hour. We worry about it. We can wring our hands and say, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? I'm going to tell you what we need to do. We need to pray and call on the name of the Lord. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sin, I'll heal their land. Second Chronicles 7, 14. That's the answer for our world today, folks. I, I'm kind of getting off my subject, ain't I? I don't, no, I don't think I am. Romans 6.13 said, he, Paul is challenging the Romans that day in, in 6 and 13. He said, neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. In other words, you know better. You know better. You don't need to be doing what you're doing is what Paul is telling them. Don't yield yourself to that. But yield, in other words, surrender, give way. Surrender yourselves unto God. As those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. And and so I believe what Paul was telling the church at Rome. We need to tell the church of Covington today. Don't give yourself to being an instrument of unrighteousness. Folks, listen, I could have got so mad last night. And it kind of frustrated me a little bit. But I know it was just kids having fun. I walked in Walmart and I needed to make an, an entrance to a... And I, I thought, well, I'll grab a buggy. I'll get what I need to go to get. It's toward the back. And I'll go to the ladies' room back there. I set, left my buggy with my stuff in it. And I was walking to the ladies' room. And there was three young people sitting on this little bench. And one of them thought how funny it would be to ask me a question. Did I not know that there was somebody already in there using the bathroom? But he didn't say it like that. I'm saying it nicely. And I said, yes, I did know that. And so I thought, when I come out... They're going to say something. Well, when I came out, they, did, they weren't there. But neither was my stuff in my buggy either. So I thought, okay, okay, that's okay. Because I'm a child of God. They were just kids having fun. That was their way of having fun. But as a Christian, we have to, we have to guard ourselves. 
because I could have went up there and say, you have got, you know, I could, ah, 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 ah. but all the way through the store, I'm thinking, they are having so much fun at my expense. I'm just talking about yielding ourselves as instruments of righteousness. Doing the right thing. Instead of getting mad and, and saying, let me see if I can find those brats. I bet they're still in here. I bet they're emptying somebody else's buggy out. No. We are a child of God, folks. I, I need to get off that, don't I? Is this okay? So, thank you. Oh, so sanctification, that's really what this lesson's about. Maybe that was just to cha challenge me about my sanctification. Huh? Could have been. I think it was. Sanctification is not our achievement for God. It is God's achievement in us. Nothing makes a parent more happy than to see their kid act like a little gentleman or a young lady and tell an older person, thank you, or yes, ma'am, or no, ma'am. You think, they are listening. They are learning. And, you know, you're, you're, nothing pleases our Heavenly Father more than when His children do what he has called us to do. Is that all right? Isn't that a beautiful analogy right there? We please our heavenly father when we do what he has taught us. When what he has put inside of us, we let it come out in our actions, in our attitudes, by being sanctified. Mm. Mercy. Our work... In sanctification is simply this. You want to hear what it is? Do you want to know what our work in sanctification is? Oh, come on, y'all. Yeah. Humor me and say yes. <laughs> Here's what our work is in sanctif sanctification. It's just simply yielding to the Spirit's work in our life. Just simply yielding. That's all he wants us to do. Here I am, Lord. Here I am, God. Take control. Do what you want to do in me. That's, that's, what, that's all God wants. That's, that's sanctification working in our life when we yield to the Spirit of God. Um, you see, sanctified completely by the Spirit. Paul talked about it in 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Oh, I didn't know I was running out of time. My goodness. Um, here's, what, here's what Paul said here in 5.23. And the very God of peace sanctify you holy in other words set apart or declare that you are holy free from sin that you're purified the very god of peace sanctify you holy when when we think of something holy we mean something entirely completely and totally how many of you want to be completely and wholly sanctified i do hey look folks i don't want to miss the mark and you know what sin is described as missing the mark Sin means missing the mark. I don't want to miss the mark. Hey, look, we've come too far. We've come too far. God's been too good. I said God's been too good. Too good to me. Sister Norton, you sang the beautiful song, I've got no reason to quit. Folks, we ain't got a reason to quit, but we've got a reason to go on. Woo. Holy Ghost coming down right now. I feel his presence in this place. So Paul, is, he's encouraging the church at Thessalonica. The very God of peace sanctify you wholly, completely, entirely. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved. How? Blameless. Woo! Blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is the power of the spirit that Paul could make what seems to be an almost outrageous claim to the church at Thessalonica that God would sanctify them wholly and preserve them blameless until, everybody say until, until the day of the Lord's return. Folks, that's what sanctification is for, that it will keep you not only part of the way, but wholly, wholly in your spirit, your soul, and body 
preserved, blameless until the day the Lord Jesus comes back after his church. I don't know about you folks, but every day I live, Lord, I, I just say, God, if there's anything that you're not pleased with me with, would you let me know that I can repent of it? I, anybody relate to that? Can you, you, you know what I'm saying? So Paul is he's emphasizing the, the, the call to sanctification. It impacts every aspect of our human life. Uh, uh, every thought, every action should be affected by God's holiness. Not my holiness, God's holiness. You see, holiness is not a one-time activity. We, we, we must allow ourselves to be holy until the Lord comes back. You see, holiness will affect our inward attitude and our outward actions. What's in here, it's going to come out here. What's in here? What's in here? We know a true tree by its fruit. That's a pear tree. I see pears on it. That's a child of God. I see the holiness of God. Come on. And so we must allow ourselves to be holy until the Lord comes. And so the prescribed level of conduct was humanly Impossible. He told the church at Thessalonica to be patient. Uh, Brother Mooney, I don't know if I put this up there or not, but 2 Thessalonians 2 and uh, 14 says that uh, we are to be patient toward all men. You know, sometimes we don't practice that as part of holiness. Sometimes we can be short with our, even our children. And it ain't really all the time what they're doing it's, it's our attitude and what we're, we're confronted with and what we're going through, and we take it out on our kids. We blast them. They'll get over it. They might not. Is that holiness? Is that sanctification? Thank you. So he said, be patient toward all men. And he, he encouraged them in verse 15 to follow that which is good. This is... Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, 15. Can, can y'all pull that up there? See that, see that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and all men. You know, the, the flesh wants to give back what people done to them. But the spirit, the spirit is going to follow that which is good. You know why, you know why we got so much evil going on? People have forgotten that vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. You know what's going on with all this killing and shooting? It's because people are wanting to get vengeance against somebody that's kill, killed or shot their loved ones. And then in verse 17, uh, Paul is telling us, as he told the church at Thessalonica, in, in 5, uh, 17, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. You say, I can't do that. You can keep a prayerful attitude all day long. You know, I find, and you, you can think I'm strange. I don't, I don't care. But just doing simple things in the house, I'll say, God, I'm praying to him. God, you know where that is. I don't know where that is. But you know, God, that's praying. And when, he fi when I find it, I say, thank you, Lord. You say, that sounds ridiculous. Well, you just go on with your ridiculous sounding. I'm just going to keep on praying. And I'm going to keep on finding what I need. Is that all right? <laughs> Poor Sister Creasy. No, I ain't getting dementia. <laughs> Hallelujah. And then he said in verse 22, to abstain. I'm still in the same chapter. Verse 22, abstain from all appearance of what? Honey, if it's evil, you better get away from it. Abstain, that means don't, 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 don't partake of it. Abstain from it. Abstain from it. All appearance of evil. If it even looks like it's got some evil to it, you better run as far as you can from that. So Paul, 
Paul's ultimate point was that the spirit, it's the spirit, folks, that is the source of power that alone will enable us to live this kind of life that he's telling us to do. It's the spirit of God that's inside of us. Look, folks, if you got Jesus on the inside, you got to let Jesus come out on the outside. Jesus on the inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. He'll change the way you act and, and treat people. I'm going to say it. It'll make the difference in your home life, too. To your companion, to your children, how you treat them. Amen. When you let the source of that power work in you. You see, the God who called us to holiness is faithful. Is faithful. 1 Thessalonians 5.24 reads it so beautifully. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will what? Do it. God is faithful. The God who called us to holiness is faithful. And he will accomplish for and in us the transformative work of sanctification. Did I say that wrong? Transformative. Yeah, that's right. In other words, he will change what needs to be changed. He'll transform us into that endure. But it comes through receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. God's spirit living on the inside. So before a believer can ever commit to walking in holiness, as the scripture has defined today, they first have to commit to walking in the spirit. Because a lifestyle of holiness disconnected from the inner working of the spirit is nothing more than pursuit of self-righteousness. And you know what our righteousness is all about, right? Self-righteousness is nothing other than arrogance. Well, I don't cuss and I don't chew and pastor says I don't fool with women that do. That's what he says. That's called self-righteousness. Self-righteousness is having an exaggerated sense of, of one's own importance or ability. But folks, here it is. It's, it's, it's easy to feel that God's love for us is directly attached to how well we behave. But according to Romans 5 and 8, God's love extended to us while we were sinners. Sometimes people don't feel like that they're worthy of God's love. But folks, Romans 5 and 8 says, but God. Everybody say those two words. But God. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. When we didn't have no love for him or anybody else, Jesus died for us when we were sinners. And if now he, knowing that, how much more as his children will he give to us what we need. So we, we are so worried by Paul's expectation, expectations that we are to live blameless until the return of Christ that we forget to read his very next sentence. It says, faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. In other words, it won't be you, but it be Christ that's living in you that will do what needs to be done until the Lord calls you home. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? Here, here's the two main differences between the cultural push for perfection and the biblical biblical call to holiness you see perfection is understood as our work okay there's people that want to be perfect that's called what you can do holiness is always and ever God's work on our behalf that's what holiness is that's God working through us you see perfection it places the focus squarely on the individual but holiness fixes our eyes on the Lord so the pursuit of holiness only works in the broader context of faith in God. Hebrews 11 and 6. I told you I was going to use it. But without faith. Everybody say without faith. But without faith it is what? Impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must what? Must believe that he is. That he is what? That he is God. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. If we doubt the natural goodness of God's character or his desire to bless and help us, we might fall into the pursuit of perfection in an attempt to convince God to like us more than he, he likes others. But that's not what it's all about. The, the, the next difference is that perfection, it emphasizes actions, but holiness emphasizes character, folks. Character is who you are. Character is what you are. Character is who you are when nobody's around. That's what our pastor tells us. 
Don't ever forget that the fundamental essence of holy living is found in manifesting the fruit of the Spirit. What is the fruit of the Spirit, Sister Creasy? You'll find it in Galatians 5, 22, 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. This is what holiness will cause you to manifest. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. And he went on to say, against such, there is no law. The fruit of the Spirit are all qualities of Christian character. If you want to know what holiness is, there it is right there. Christian character in the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, one problem with the action-centered focus of perfection is is what could be called the, the slide toward minimum. You know, people that want to do just the minimum to get by in living for God. Folks, that ain't what it's all about. Being perfect really becomes nothing more than being better than everyone else. And it always it is always possible to find somebody doing much worse than we are. So God is more interested in who we become than in what we do because if we become Christ-like folks in our character, we will reliably respond in, in any given crisis with a Christ-like action. In other words, if we have that Christ-like attitude, our actions are going to be like the Lord too. And in, in a very real sense, folks, holiness, are you ready for this? Holiness is simply the word for what happens in us as we grow closer to God and to our brothers and sisters in the, in the Lord. It's more of a byproduct than an independent aim. You see, holiness is not the pursuit of perfection, but rather holiness is the perfection of pursuit. Y'all didn't get that. Y'all didn't get that. I didn't hear very many amens from it. I'm going to say it one more time. I'm going to say it one more time. Holiness is not the pursuit of perfection, but holiness is the perfection of pursuit. What am I pursuing? I'm pursuing God, drawing closer to God. That's holiness, folks. That's holiness. So I have a challenge for you today. You ready for my challenge? I know all the kids are coming in and we're looking at all them, but are you ready? Can I get a better ready? All right. Here's my challenge. You said you're ready. Here's my first challenge. If you want to pursue holiness, you pursue, first of all, you pursue God. Everybody say pursue God. Then the next thing I'm challenging you to is to pursue a relationship, and that is with God. Let it grow every day. Let it grow. Talk to him more. Talk to him more. Worship him more. Talk to him more. Pursue that relationship. Then pursue love. Pursue love. In other words, don't just try to love people. Rely on that love that God has called you, that you can love people. Amen. Replace, uh, do the next right thing with walking in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Don't just say, I think I can do this. No, walk in the Spirit. Let God work through you. Let the Spirit of God do it for you. It's, he's not asking you to do anything that His Spirit will not lead you and guide you and help you to do. And, and so replace the word achieve with attempt. In other words, uh, drawing closer to God, it moves us away from the world and its influences. And temptations will lose their grip. And wrong attitudes finally can be identified and rejected. So I'm asking you today, will you be perfect? No. But you will be holy when you pursue God, when you pursue a relationship, when you pursue a love, and when you, when you replace, uh, amen, uh, uh, trying, and, 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 and when you replace uh, drawing closer to God and getting away from worldly influence, when you do all of these things, then that's, that's what holiness is, folks. And I'm going to tell you, the Bible says, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. I want to challenge you today. Pursue God. Get closer to God. Draw nigh to God. Draw nigh to God. All you got to do is be willing. Yield yourself. That's holiness in the eyes of the Lord. God bless you today.